This is 21 This Week. I'm Mark Uncafer, sitting in for Casey Aiken. Coming up next, who are the winners and losers from the recently completed 2023 Maryland General Assembly session? Are Mark Elrich's proposed 10% tax hike and budget increases justified? And will the county council go along? What's Governor Moore's plan to end gridlock? Our panel of insiders will give you the story behind the story. We're joined by former Maryland delegate Marise Morales and Montgomery County Republican Central Committee member and president of the Montgomery County Federation of Republican Women, Lori Halverson. Stay tuned for these stories and more on 21 This Week next. Welcome back to 21 This Week. In the last few weeks, the 2023 legislature, uh, Maryland legislature adjourned. This was the first General Assembly for Governor Wes Moore. And it, this wouldn't be a talking head show if we didn't try and handicap the politics and focus on the winners and losers. Marseille, you've had experience in Annapolis as a delegate. Who do you think the winners and losers were? Absolutely. And it's, it's bittersweet because I definitely miss my time in, in the legislature. Um, but I've also am so proud to see some of the changes that were even when I was still there, we were pushing through. Uh, I would say that Delegate C.T. Wilson from Charles County uh, finally got his the extension of the sexual limitations for uh, sex, uh, child victims of, of, of sexual assault. And I think it was a long time coming. I, I believe it's been at least 15 to 20 years that he's been kind of pushing for this. Um, and other than that, I would say Governor Moore really got through some of his priority, his uh, administration's priorities. Although there were some, you know, there were some glitches with uh, some of the appointments, which you know, which is which is to be expected by any kind of you know brand new governor. I would also say that Ben Barnes, as his first the first chair, first time chair of um, appropriations, did really well. Um, and I know that in the Senate we had. Uh, Senator Melanie Griffith also as the, the new chair of finance and, you know, being a woman of color, um, I think that was, is wonderful to, to see her standing out in that. And lastly, I would say uh, Senator Feldman in the brand new committee dealing with education and environment. So it's just been really great to see, um, you know, I would say in general, I think all of Marylanders are winners just seeing the uh, progressive uh, legislation that's that's been passed. Well, Lori, you may have a slightly different point of view, and that's why this is a, a show that uh, we go back and forth. What are the bills that you think should have passed and didn't, and what are the bills that shouldn't have and did? Should have passed that didn't. I would say the biggest one is SB1, which was the firearms bill, where overwhelmingly um, the, the people who testified were against this bill, yet it still passed and it flies in the face of a Supreme Court justice ruling. So I'm sure that it'll go to the Supreme Court and, and in the end, we'll be proving all of the delegates who voted for it uh, to be wrong and to be uh, voting against what they, you know, they're supposed to be following the Maryland Constitution and the, and the U.S. Constitution, and they obviously didn't because now you know, it's be harder for people to um, take their firearms outside of their home. Um, and another bill would be the, there's a couple transgender bills that passed that actually, I talked about one of them in another 21 This Week show uh, that actually give transgenders more rights than people who are not transgenders because Medicaid will allow for more things uh, than uh, for transgenders than for non-transgenders. It'll also allow transgenders to go to the uh, jail of their of their sexual identity. Um, so that is something that has changed. Um, something that should uh, should have passed that didn't was, I would say, Kathy Shalega's bill about women uh, in uh, sports. Uh, in, instead, transgenders will still be allowed to compete against women in sports. And that is just not right. <laughs> um, so that's my summation. So Marise, when you look back in, in the future, what do you think this year's General Assembly will be most remembered for? I would say for uh, many human rights issues, I think we will be remembered for the reproductive health care bills, uh, in addition to extending um, health coverage for uh, our transgender Marylanders. 
um, and obviously cannabis. I think that um, Governor Moore, um, you know, is, is able to take the credit for a lot of things, but at, you know, just to kind of um, also just bring in the, the 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 narrative of the legislature really pushing for these things. You know, I, I would say every every um, legislative session, but really seeing those bills come into fruition and seeing it being more mainstream. So just knowing from the body, like uh, Delegate C.T. Wilson is, is uh, actually one of the more conservative Democrats. And so seeing him kind of leading some of these um, issues, it really kind of tells you the environment that we're in in, in Annapolis. And that one, it's, it's, a, it's, it's I know for, for our Republican Marylanders, you know, I understand that they, that they will disagree with me and that's okay. But I would just say that it's, it's balanced in that even within the Democratic majority, um, you know, there's not like an abuse of power. Basically, we try to bring in all the different perspectives into the legislation that passed for the benefit of, of all of Maryland. So it's interesting. One of the <clears throat> one of the areas that we didn't talk about were some of the environmental changes, some of which are coming down the road. Of uh, uh, obviously, there was an administrative change, but reflected also in legislation uh, banning the use of gas used powered cars that comes up in the future. So. That may be another topic that we talk about well into the future. And that actually provides a, a transition into the uh, sort of next topic, which is uh, transportation. Uh, now, for, for a long time now, just about every poll in our area has ranked transportation and gridlock as one of the top voter concerns. And, and elections have consequences. And one of the changes in policy from the transition from Larry Hogan to West Moore seems to be in that area. Uh, Transurban has dropped out of the public-private partnership that would have extended those hot or uh, high occupancy toll lanes from Virginia to Maryland. And some of the money would have been used to pay for uh, American Legion bridge improvements. Uh, Lori, uh, Governor Moore says he'll focus more on mass transit. Is he right or was Governor Hogan's approach better? Well, Hogan was business smart in that he looked at the data and saw that MDTOT was having shortfalls in their budget and in revenues. Ridership was continually going down. It was going down before um, COVID and then COVID made it so much worse. Uh, so, and, and you know, already half the budget in transportation goes to mass transit. So I think, you know, what, uh, Westmore is, is not, he, He's going off the road, so to speak, on um, on the path that we were following, and uh, I, I think that the Virginia—you can just look at Virginia—that their public-private partnership um, was very successful with their toll roads. Uh, it saved 10 million customers, more than 3.3 million hours on the road. Um, now they where they can be with their families at home, um, more businesses, more jobs more money to invest in equity, so to speak, what do Democrats say they want, because now they're able to invest more in women and minority businesses. Um, and, you know, cars are 97% of all travel. So what the heck are they doing when there's very percentage wise, most people are driving? Well, you mentioned obviously a key statistic, which is the fact that so many people rely on their car to get cars to get to work or to get from one place to another. Marise, how can we encourage alternatives to driving uh, in a car alone? Absolutely, and this is you know this is ob uh, absolutely a, a different. Uh, it, it's a it's a, a matter of priorities, um, and so with the Moore administration, uh, he has been very blunt about you know considering the environment and in our future on this earth. So it's really a cultural shift, um, you know, getting more Americans to basically move closer to their to their. Um, uh, positions of employment. You know, it's 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 not unknown for folks to you know be okay with an hour, an hour and a half of a commute. Um, so it's going to be it's going to take mass transit. It's going to take a cultural shift. And you know, even I mean, even just looking at what my generation, so millennials and you know, young families, what they're doing is exactly that. They're looking, for, and so it's more about housing and also the transportation in our roads. And people just you know making a sacrifice and saying, you know, maybe I I won't have a huge house and. Maybe I'll have you know a little bit you know a smaller plot of land, but it's going to get closer to where I work, and then I can commute. I can I can commute by you know, by bike. I can commute by a train or whatever. Um, so I, I think it's really going to take um, you know a culture shift, but 
the first, the, the key in seeing the shift in our culture is seeing what our elected officials are actually doing and prioritizing. So there's definitely a, a change from the Hogan administration, and you know, and that and that's to be expected. It's two different, two different parties, two different sets of of, of uh, priorities there. Well, Lori, uh, one of the changes that's being suggested uh, by the uh, Moore administration is mark train expansion. Uh, and, and obviously that's the, the, the commuter rail that uh, operates in Maryland and their recommendation is to expand it into Virginia and into Delaware. That said, Lori, public transportation ridership remains a long way from returning to pre-COVID levels. For example, with Mark Train, uh, it's still down 75%, less than 10,000 uh, daily riders. Is this a permanent change or can we expect a, a return to uh, more public transit use? Yeah, the Democrats need to get with the times because um, they keep thinking we need mass transit all the time. But look what's happening with technology and look what's happening with our cultural change, where I think 40 percent of the uh, build uh, of the buildings are being used in New York City right now. Um, you know, there's people are not going to locations as much to work now. They're working from home and they can pick wherever they want to live. We, we now have to compete with other states that aren't used to having a lot of people. Um, and so things have changed and Democrats aren't um, um, are not in line with what's really happening. Imagine a, a, where old people who um, have trouble driving can have a car, pick them up and drive them without a person driving. They won't have to drive. They don't, you know, it, it that can happen. We're door to door service with energy efficient cars, small cars can drive wherever we want to go in a short amount of time. Things like that can happen and we can stay away from um, uh, traffic in, uh, accidents by technology that's that exists today. So, you know, that's what needs. I think we need to just start changing our thinking a little bit, uh, especially the Democrats. Well, when we come back from this short break, will Mark Elridge get his tax hike? Well, welcome back. County Executive Elridge has proposed a 10% property tax increase. Now, this would pay for more county support for the public schools and has the fight has pitted homeowners against government employee unions, which have very actively rallied in support of the increase. So far, the council has been caught in the middle, and it's really not clear whether or not they're going to go along. Merce, what's your take? Will the council go along with the increase, and, and should they? That is the million-dollar question, right? Um, you know, I think at this point, looking at our priorities in the county and just seeing, uh, you know, just the hit that our school and our school teachers have, have taken uh, post-pandemic times, I think it's important to look at, you know, if we want to have quality quality education, then we really need to pay for what we're looking for. And just looking at uh, looking at it from a millennial's perspective, I can tell you when I was in law school, all, most of my class members and the people that I gravitated towards had started their careers as teachers, uh, but just did not really, you know, just wasn't going to be sustainable in the long run. So just looking at what this, uh, what Mark Elrich's um, and, and, and um, um, uh, Madalino, um I'm thinking, I'm just blanking on his name, even though he's like a close friend of mine. What they're really talking about is, you know, what the county needs to come up with in order for us to push through for the blueprint. And some of the some of the issues are really starting salaries for our educators. And we're looking at an increase from 60,000 to 75,000. Um, and, you know, it just, if you think about all the student debt, because educators, I mean, they are, you know, our sharp and our brightest um, individuals that we would like to, you know, recruit. And you're looking at, you know, graduate school, um, student debt, undergrad student debt, and all of this in the continuing education that is needed. And, and also not to mention the, the diverse needs of our county. So I think that, um, you know, just looking at, for an example, a homeowner who owns a $600,000 home would see uh, a $600 tax increase. So we're going from 98, uh, 98 cents to the $100, about going to then, uh, I think it's $1.28 for, for the $100 of, you know, of your uh, the footage in your in your home. So I think it's something that we can't afford and something that as a collective, uh, we should be looking at an investment for our future and what we want uh, the county to, you know, to be able to produce in terms of the leaders, the engineers, the educators of tomorrow. Lori, County Executive Elridge just says the property uh, owners should support the increase because otherwise their property values may go down. And his theory is that uh, MoCo real estate 
values depends on the perceived value of the Montgomery County Public Schools. And if that, that perceived value goes away, values will go down. So what do you think of that as an argument? Well, look, we, we, this is a 10% increase on top of the increases that we already got in our property values, which, you know, my house went way up in the property value. Um, that is much big. It's at this, in these times, it's it's unthinkable to do something like that. And the the problem is the blueprint passed without a way to pay for it. Democrats screwed up again, and now our county is struggling to try to meet the needs. And oh, what the, what are they trying to do? They're trying to add more teachers and add more pay. That's what Mark Eller just saying. We got to pay teachers more. Yeah, that's true. Teachers deserve to be paid a lot of money. However. Um, I'm not hearing any new ideas. Over the years, we have done the same thing over and over again, and I'm tired of it. We need to change the ideas. We need to add more choice. We need to increase the boost, which is a voucher program, which our Democrats, uh, most Democrats have been against, and it's really a bipartisan thing in a lot of states. So we really need to think of new ideas in this state to make education better. People are gonna be leaving, they're already leaving. Um, when you look at the latest data from the census, you can see over 7,000 people have left the, the county. They're leaving with their feet. And um, it, it already is out there that education is worse in Montgomery County. And it's worse because we're not doing anything new. Well, you're right. That is a, a big sea change, this change in population after years and years of growth. But um, let me just turn to Marisa with this increased local spending. That's already been mandated over the next couple of years um, as a result of what we've already talked about, which is the Corwin or, or or blueprint proposal. So these increases in some respects are already baked in. So is this a case of pay me now or pay me later? I, I mean, I wouldn't really frame it in that way. I would say it's, you know, it's, it's the meeting of, of different things. The blueprint has been, you know, as you mentioned, has been in the works from the Kerwin Commission, but then we also have to deal with the consequences of the project. Um, and, you know, so I think that at this point, we know the values of our county. And I'm, I am certain that the council is going to take into consideration, you know, Lori's views, because again, we are, you know, as elected officials, we represent all of our constituents. So I think that, you know, I trust in the kind of the, the kind of council is going to come up with a balanced approach. And we also understand, you know, the give and take between um, the county executive and the county council. So I don't think, you know, it's going to be just, I'm going to get my way and I'm going to bulldoze it through. I think it really is going to be a result of kind of a balanced conversation. So we will wait to see. There's a certain amount of drama on that. There's a schedule that goes on in May uh, as, as we wrap up. Uh, so we'll see what, what the council ends up coming up with on that. So one of the unique aspects of Maryland politics is that political central party political central committees get to fill legislative vacancies. And uh, the Montgomery County Democratic Central Committee has filled four so far this year. It, it has another one in the works. Uh, for uh, Kumar Barve, who's been uh, uh, is being nominated for another appointment, Marse, is this the right way to fill these legislative vacancies, or should the voters decide in a special election? You know, this is really a fascinating question, and that's something that um, I never was really in favor of. Like, just kind of like you know, just small bodies um, electing you know the um, individuals to fulfill these you know, open seats. Um, I think it's going to take, you know, it's going to take some legislative changes, et cetera. And we have seen some leaders uh, come up with that, um, you know. And so I think at this point, I think most most uh, voting individuals would probably agree with that. You know, I think that the, it is not a very democratic process. And even members of the Census Committee themselves, you know, have chosen to recuse themselves. They, they do different things to kind of neutralize, uh, neutralize it. Like we saw Mark uh, Robles, who was also one of the candidates that ran for the District 49 seat, and he's a current member of of the central committee um, and he took it upon himself to achieve himself. And, you know, I mean, I think nobody was asking him to do it. He just did it uh, because he got it right thing to do. But also, you know, I've also uh, fallen on my sword and, you know, I've ultimately did that get him elected? It didn't. So it's like, you know, at the end of the day, the rules, I didn't write the rules. You know, like, I think it's time to modernize the rules. So, Lori, you're, you've been a bystander on this. Uh, you're on your party's central committee, but because Republicans have no legislative seats, you, 
you have no prospects of filling any vacancies, at least for the next four years. So um, what do you think? Are the current rules right or should there be special elections? Well, there are 25 states that have special elections and uh, only nine states are like our state where the governor makes the decision after the um, after the central committee makes a, a um, recommendation. I, I really think we should go to special elections uh, after researching through this. I think that it, um, I, I, our county is not, it's not just a small little county where everyone's the same. Every portion of the county is very different, up county versus down county versus Chevy Chase, which is close to DC versus the Ag Reserve. Everything is different. So how could a, um, how could a central committee vote for one specific district when they don't really know the needs of that district. It's better for the people in that district to vote for the, for the person they want to win. But you, all, you also wanna make sure that they're represented during the session. Um, and so there's maybe, maybe there's a hybrid form or maybe we should just figure out how to do elections where we can quickly get someone elected, but fairly elected. So, um, so I think something needs to change. I certainly wouldn't want, wouldn't want the responsibility of voting for a person in a district uh, like in the Ag Reserve because I'm not as familiar with the needs of the Ag Reserve as I should be. Well, thank you for that. And, and now uh, we will return uh, for uh, after a short break with parting shots. Welcome back. And now for parting shots. Marise, you start. I would just say that um, I'm very pleased to see some of the um, most recent appointees, um, or I would say governor uh, recommendations for um, Senate. You know that District 16, Ariana Kelly, she's our, our, our senator there. Um, among others, uh, Bernie's American, American North. And I think there's something to be said about, um, you know, kind of um, keeping the, the, um, the, the team structure in the districts, because if, when you look at how efficient our legislature is, we did pass 800, about 800 bills. And when you don't have that team structure, or when there's a little bit of uh, dissonance in the priorities of that district, you do take a little bit longer. And, you know, and so I, I think that there's something to be said just going off of the last conversation uh, talking about the uh, the new District 39 uh, vacancy that was filled. Lori, you're up. Yes, prom season's coming up and graduations and going to the beach with the you know kids having fun. But just want to uh, just a word of caution, please, parents and grandparents, have discussions with your grandchildren and your kids. Uh, who are going to be going to these events and talk to them about drugs. Uh, it seems our kids are getting the messages about drinking and driving, but not about um, drugs, you know, like smoking pot and, and driving and how dangerous that can be. So please talk to your, your kids and, and keep them safe through this, this fun time in their lives. Yes, you're right, Lori. That certainly would want to avoid a, a tragedy in, a, in a, a, what would otherwise be a, a celebratory uh, time. Thank you for tuning in each week for my MC Media and Montgomery County's hardest hitting talk show, 21 This Week.